I'm sure you guys have heard about Carvana. It's called Carvana. And when you see Carvana, you've got Nirvana. That's what this market's about, is finding the next Carvana. Today, our journey takes us through the rise and crash of Carvana, a company that for a time seemed to defy the gravity of traditional car sales. A company founded by a father-son duo will learn how their impressive start was fueled by the father's past business, Drive Time Automotive Group, and how the duo came out on top even as the stock price came crashing down. Let's dive in. Our story starts with Ugly Duckling, a rental car agency that hit bankruptcy in 1989. Ernest Garcia Jr. tasked himself with picking up the ashes of the company after buying the assets and transforming the company into a dealership model before picking up financial service assets midway through the 1990s. After a brief stint as a public company in 2002, Garcia Jr. had enough of the public life and bought out shareholders in a go-private transaction before rebranding as Drive Time. Fast forward to 2012 when junior son Ernest Garcia III, a Stanford University graduate with an engineering degree, gets a gig at his dad's company. Fresh out of school, Garcia III, along with friends Ryan Keaton and Ben Houston, established Carvana as a subsidiary of Drive Time, an online used car dealer with a twist. Carvana would buy most of their used car inventory from Drive Time and sell it via vending machines. In exchange, Drive Time would purchase the loans that Carvana gave to customers. It was textbook synergy and perhaps borderline financial engineering. More on that later. With access to a feast of used car inventory and a hefty helping of financial support from Daddy Drive Time, Carvana was off to the races, getting big enough that it was eventually spun out of Drive Time in 2014. The model for Carvana on the surface is simple. Self-described as the Amazon for cars, the company sprinkles in a bit of tech for that extra pizzazz when it comes to making the experience more memorable, which includes the use of its famous car vending machines. But make no mistake, at its core, Carvana is a used car dealer with the exception of calling their car lots, vending machines, and their website an app. Customers can look online or go to a physical vending machine to pick out a car. These cars are sourced from auctions, trade-ins, partnered dealerships, individuals, uh, the same as pretty much any other used car dealer. Once a car is sold, it's either delivered to the customer's doorstep or picked up at one of the 33 futuristic car vending machines across the country. They also offer a seven day return policy advertised as a no questions asked policy. Quite simply, the model has worked brilliantly. Well, kind of. If growth is the scorecard and the stock market bubble fueled by near zero interest rates is your playing field, Carvana has been the perfect player in this game. From their humble start in 2012 to going public in 2017, the company has seen revenue hit $859 million the year they went public on the NYSE, up 135% from the previous year. But there was a problem. That same year, the company still managed to lose $164 million in net income. The 2017 IPO saw the company raise $225 million at a $1.5 billion valuation. Not too shabby for a company that started as a family side project. Usually when a company goes public, the trade-off is that the original creators give up a stake in the company in exchange for capital. You know, money, dollar bills, some green. Dollar, dollar bill, yeah. <laughs> Upon going public, the Garcia family held a whopping 97% of the voting interest in Carvana, meaning if investors were upset for, let's say, Carvana's stock price cratering due to management incompetence, investors wouldn't be able to force a change. Well, unless the Garcia family wanted the change, but let's remember Garcia III was the CEO. Carvana also set up what's known as a tax receivable agreement during the IPO. It's a fancy term for a deal where early investors get most of the value of the tax assets. If the company uses these assets to reduce its tax bills, the company agrees to pay beneficiaries of the agreement 85% of that benefit in cash. How much was this tax receivable agreement worth, you might ask? Well, $1.1 billion, and most of it was going to the Garcia family. Are you seeing a pattern here? Carvana at its core was just a used car sales company, but with a splash of tech, a dollop of convenience, and a whole lot of Garcia family control. The go public was monumental for Carvana. They now had a new currency to deal in, equity, and they wasted no time doing this. 
The same year as their go public, the company bought Carlipso for an undisclosed amount. Months later, they bought Car360 for $22 million. The purchase of Peers proved to be impactful. Revenue soared, reaching $3.9 billion by the end of 2019. Yet the business still didn't make much sense from a financial perspective. The company lost a combined $600 million for the years ended 2018 and 2019. Despite the financials proving that selling used cars from a vending machine didn't really make a whole lot of sense, Carvana ended 2019 with a valuation of nearly $5 billion. The company was a beneficiary of a bull market that loves stocks that had anything to do with tech that demonstrated top-line revenue growth. And so Carvana raced through its early years of making daring acquisitions and posting impressive sales growth, all while expecting losses to be funded by investors and the Garcia family continuing to see their net worth get even bigger. And then 2020 hit, and with it, a pandemic that was sure to kill any business in its path. But when your business model revolves around minimal physical contact and no sleazy car salesman, a global pandemic is the equivalent of striking gold. Online car retailer Carvana, Carvana has been a pandemic darling, up more than 130% over the last year. Valued at $45 billion, its market cap now rivals some traditional automakers like Ford, Honda, and Stellantis. And gold it was. Carvana saw revenues grow to $5.6 billion by the end of 2020, and more than double in 2021 to $12.8 billion. Investors took note of this massive growth and started to aggressively buy Carvana stock. And guess who was there to capitalize on this massive windfall? You guessed it, the father and son duo. Garcia Jr. would start to sell shares daily for months, selling 30,000 shares a day under an automated share sale program known as a 10B51 plan. But the party didn't stop there. As the stock price soared above $350 in the summer of 2021, Junior's sell-off increased to 60,000 shares on most days. By the time the dust had settled, Junior had managed to offload more than $3.5 billion over 10 months as investors continued to hit the buy button. On the business side of things, however, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. While they were busy introducing touchless delivery and pickup and watching their stock price soar, they had a few bumps in the road. They were banned from selling cars in the rally area of North Carolina until January 2022, after the North Carolina Division for Motor Vehicles sued, claiming that they failed to deliver titles to the DMV, all while selling vehicles without a state inspection. But there was even a bigger problem. Despite revenue soaring, the company still lost money, with losses in 2021 growing to $287 million. So while the world was in lockdown, Carvana was busy transforming the used car market and the Garcia family was turning that into a personal cash cow despite the company still losing money. So we've covered the meteoric rise of Carvana, but as they say, what goes up must come down and boy did Carvana come down. This one is just a total house of pain. Sell, sell, sell. House of pain. By the end of 2021, their market cap was sitting pretty at $20 billion. Fast forward to today, and it's a sobering $2.1 billion. Now, you might be wondering what brought about this precipitous fall from grace. Well, let me tell you, it was a combination of factors. First off, Carvana co-founder and CEO Garcia III said on the company's fourth quarter earnings call for 2022 that 2023 would be a difficult year for Carvana, citing a normalization of the used vehicle industry from its inflated levels and increasing interest rates. Among other factors, he described the end of the third quarter as the most unaffordable point ever for customers who financed a vehicle purchase. And this showed in the financials in Q4 of 2022. Carvana saw revenues drop 16% in a single quarter, marking its single largest quarterly loss of $1.44 billion, a number almost equal to the cumulative loss for the company since going public. Then there were the legal issues. Carvana was banned from doing business in Illinois, not once, but twice over registration and title issues. They were handing out temporary registrations from other states, like candy at a parade, which caused some customers to get tickets. Not exactly a great look for such a large brand. But the cherry on top of this disaster Sunday was the $2.2 billion acquisition of Odessa's U.S. auction business. Now, you might think that adding 56 physical sites would be a good move, but Carvana's decision to borrow $3.3 billion to fund the purchase only ballooned their interest expense. 
Their business model, which once seemed innovative and pandemic-proof, started to crumble under the weight of its mounting debt and legal issues. So while Carvana's rise was impressive, their fall was even more dramatic. But hey, it's not all bad. At least they now have 56 physical sites to hold on to all those unsold cars. Let's wrap it up. As we reach the end of our high octane journey through the rise and fall of Carvana, we're left with some important lessons in the rear view mirror. For a while, Carvana seemed to be the ultimate disruptor in the used car market, blazing a trail with its innovative business model, or at least that's what the Garcia family wanted you to think as they sold multiples of billions of dollars of shares into the open market. Yet, as history has often shown us, even the most promising ventures can hit a bump in the road, especially when they're steered by unchecked ambition, family control, and a lack of regulatory compliance. So guys, we just recently launched this channel and we noticed that 99.9% .9 of our viewers are not subscribed. So if you enjoyed this video, we need your help in growing this channel. By subscribing, that would help us keep the lights on and make sure that our crews have jobs in these uncertain times. So please hit that subscribe button and we promise to make more quality videos that I'm sure you're gonna love. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us on this ride and until next time keep your eyes on the road ahead and always do your due diligence when buying a high-flying tech startup especially from a used car salesman let me know what you think in the comment section do you think that carvana has a nice future is it time to consider going long the stock let me know what you think in the comment section i love you all